Let me explain to you uh, just a bit that this extra piece of paper in your bulletin is to allow you to take some notes and um, the uh, blanks there are for you to fill in. So if you brought your crayon or your uh, pen or your pencil, you could stick your finger, I think, and use blood if you wanted to. But uh, this has two purposes. One is what I'm going to be talking about is, granted, complicated. Um, this will allow you to follow along uh, with the paper as well as on the screen. And when you use more of your brain, not just listening, but seeing and then actually writing some of these things, it will bring it into your thinking better. So this is not a happy devotional. This is uh, a way of thinking that will set you into a position to argue for the faith against what the world has. I mentioned earlier that uh, the verse, Proverbs 19.20, Hear counsel, receive instruction, that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. This is kind of the theme of this because uh, there is, a, 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 for just me, it's so irritating to find that uh, positions that I've had to wrestle with and come to a conclusion that people kind of laugh and, oh, it's very cute that you think that way, you know. They have this attitude of such superiority. We were down in Tennessee and went to a Bible museum. And so the fellow there, one of the workers, said, uh, said now all of these uh, books over here are for the King James only people. And he said, we got a lot of them around here. <laughs> and then uh, Don said to him, yeah, I think this is one of them here. He pointed to me. And the guy goes, oh, really? And uh, so, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to say to him, uh, are you aware how many of the translations that you sell here are actually based on the, uh, the Greek text that, has, that uh, represents the majority of the Greek manuscripts? Only one, and that's the King James Version. Um, you know, let's, let's laugh about the stupid people that are King James only. Um, this is uh, this is no laughing matter. Uh, they're, they're translating the Word of God, and it is it is the Word of God. It is uh, containing the Word of God, but they've eliminated so much, and they've changed so much that um, you're going to find that if you are consistent with that, as these people are trying to be, if you're consistent with that you lose the emphasis that God inspired the words because they have to admit they don't have the words anymore. One man said God could have preserved his words, but he didn't. And that's, that's where they live. That's where they are. So their idea of inspiration has to come somewhere between some ideas are okay and much of what it says is, generally good, but you can't count on the words. So that's what this is. I hope you will uh, take that and, and allow it. And I'm going to try to notice this. The reason I have it here is that I'm trying to uh, notice when I should stop and say this is fill in the blank. All right? Let's look then at the larger uh, work that we'll be looking at is the concept of God and the skeptics. <clears throat> now, skeptics is just a general term for people that are not believers because they say, well, I'm skeptical of believing this or that. Now, part one of this, we're going to be looking at seven skeptical doubts. We're going to be looking at what they say they believe. Now, uh, we can say, you're wrong because the Bible says this. However, uh, they're not there yet. So what I would like for them to do is to understand a little bit about what it is they're saying they believe. And I'd like for you to see that as well. Two real points here. 
if you are a believer, consider these doubts and let God's answers that we'll be giving you build you into a stronger believer and a more mature Christian. You, you will have, dare I say, the ammunition to deal with people who are skeptics. And you say, oh, well, I was reading about that. I, I, I heard about that. I was wondering, though, if you could explain something to me. And you ask them some, hopefully, uh, piercing questions. Now, if you are a skeptic, I would like for you to consider these discussions as revealing in you a faith hidden in your doubts. You have probably convinced yourself that you don't go by faith. You go by some fact. But in fact, you are going by a faith. And I would like to cast doubt on your faith. The only way you can doubt a certain faith is to hold a position in a different faith. You must hold that position so strongly that you deny the other faith. So what you're actually saying is you're not denying faith. You are saying the faith in what I believe in is better than what you believe in. Now we have something to deal with. We have something to argue about. The first doubt that I want to present to you that the skeptics would say is, is there can't be just one true religion. I remember when uh, Dr. Bob uh, the third, the last uh, of the Dr. Bobs that uh, were, were in charge of Bob Jones University, um, brought that up at, on an Oprah Winfrey show. And she was just dumbfounded, shocked. She said, but, but, but that can't be true. Why, that would mean that everybody's wrong except for you. There can't be just one true religion. So let's analyze the proposition. For you to believe that, then, you assume that all religions are alike. We'll be looking at that. Secondly, it assumes that all religions evolved. Filling in the blanks here. It assumes that all religions are alike. Secondly, that all religions evolved, that they're just made up by men. And over a period of time, instead of saying ugh and, and, and ducking away from lightning, you said ugh must be God. And so they evolved religions, you see. And then three, it assumes that all religions came from man. Came from man. Now let me tell you this story. A college, a, a true story, a college invited a Christian pastor, a Jewish rabbi, and a Muslim imam. Now, it sounds like the beginning of a joke, right? I think I told you the one about the uh, pastor, the uh, imam, and a rabbit came into a, uh, a, a tavern. And the guy says to the rabbit, what do you want? And he says, don't bother with me. I think I'm a typo. Supposed to be rabbi, rabbi said. Um, anyway, but they came to discuss differences among religions. Differences among religions, representing three major religions. Each one, at the end of this thing, admitted there were irreconcilable differences. Now, this is going to be important. Uh, they did not say, hey, what do you know? We all believe about the same thing. They said, no, each one of us hold to something different from the other two. There are irreconcilable differences. Now, one example that would mean something to us was the person of Jesus Christ. They agreed on this statement. Now, you might want to um, uh, follow along on the paper there as well as on this. Here's the statement. If Christians are right about Jesus being God, then Muslims and Jews fail in a serious way to love God as God really is. You catch that? That those religions are wrong. They're not serving God that they claim to serve. 
if Jesus is actually God. But if Muslims and Jews are right that Jesus is not God, but rather perhaps a gifted teacher, perhaps a gifted prophet, then Christians fail in a serious way to love God as God really is. Christians are wrong. It came down to that, that they were not all alike and that there were irreconcilable differences. Well, several of the students did not like that conclusion because it didn't fit with what they believed. Here was the evidence in front of them. They said, no, we don't like that. Who cares what you like? This is the fact, see. They had falsely assumed that all religions were alike and therefore could cooperate with each other. Otherwise, world peace would constantly be disturbed because of religious differences. Read warfare. This is an argument based on ignorance. So, as a skeptic, do you really want to base your argument on ignorance of the fact that all the religions are not alike? They are not all generally speaking of some do-goodism stuff. They have specific meanings that differ one from another. Now, let's move secondly to analyze the proposals that such people have made. One is, we ought to outlaw religion. Well, this has been done and tried. This gives the political government authority over what people believe. It is very dangerous, as seen in the times in history, where they actually implemented this idea. When was this? Well, French Revolution comes to mind. It outlawed religion and many were executed. You know the, the guillotine, you know the guillotine, Madame Guillotine. Uh, it was busy and streets were rolling in heads and blood because they said no religion. They, they actually got rid of the seven day week because that came from Genesis 1, 1 to 3. Um, uh, they. Uh, they went to a digital system. It was a 10-day week. Hitler's Nazi Germany sought to eliminate the Jews and the gypsies and many Christian pastors that wouldn't compromise. Nazism is notorious for its murder. You say, wow, that's pretty bad. Uh, wait a minute. These pale by comparison, however, to the work of the 20th century. Soviet Russia, communist China, still persecuting to the death people of faith, communist China, and the Khmer Rouge of Vietnam murdered millions. Alistair McGrath in his book, The Twilight of Atheism, page 230, said this, the 20th century gave rise to one of the greatest and most distressing paradoxes, paradoxes where opposites are put together, of human history that the greatest intolerance and violence of that century were practiced by those who believed that religion caused intolerance and violence. Do you catch the irony, the paradox? They were blaming religion for intolerance and violence, and so they, with intolerance and violence, tried to murder them all. So we dare not enter again into that realm of vicious and dehumanizing extermination. Um, the, the most drastic of skeptics, I think, would hesitate to say, you step on the Bible, you deny Jesus Christ, or we just murder you right there. The second proposal is we don't have to go that far. Let's just Condemn religion. <laughs> Condemn religion. Well, the idea of condemning religion socially discourages religion through education and cultural example. This was uh, way back in one of the uh, uh, Asian religions. They said, we'll practice, we'll, we'll get um, the uh, educated people and we'll get the celebrities to represent this 
And then people will want to be like them. And so all of their cultural, the, the teacups, ceremonies, and all these things, these were things that celebrities did and, and the educated people did. And then people just wanted to be like them. The result hoped for is all religious people have to admit that each religion is just one of many equally valid paths to God. Hey, we're all trying to get to the same place. We just pick different ways. Those who disagree, then, are stigmatized as foolish or dangerous. We're hearing this from the government today. Dangerous. The FBI should be checking these people as extremists. And this idea has worked pretty well in the Western world. Let us examine the several beliefs involved. If you say condemn religion, then you have to believe some of this. First, all major religions are essentially the same. Joe Klein on the Time Magazine blog of March 7, 2007 wrote that anyone who thinks there are inferior religions is a right-wing extremist. <laughs> what, really? Common sense tells us that Jim Jones' religion that tells its people to commit suicide and the religions that practice child sacrifice are in fact inferior. It's not just my opinion that they're inferior. They are. This is murder. Religions that murder are inferior. Secondly, actual fact is, as the panelists that we mentioned before said, there are irreconcilable differences if you know what these religions really teach. You live in this ignorant world of saying they're all about the same when you don't know enough about any of them to understand. Buddhism, maybe you don't know this, but Buddhism is at heart atheistic. There is no God in Buddhism. It's all about how to live. Hinduism is at heart materialism. All is the Brahman. You know what the Brahman is? It's the sum total of all things. It's the universe. Christianity and others hold to a personal God who will hold people accountable for their beliefs and practices. These are radically different. They're not all essentially the same. And then thirdly, it is internally inconsistent to teach that a doctrine does not matter. Yeah, they have their different doctrines, but doctrines doesn't matter. <laughs> Let me clue you in. This teaching is a doctrine. You're claiming that doctrine doesn't matter. That's your doctrine. You see? A specific view of a God that differs from uh, the biblical view, that's a doctrine. Atheism is a doctrine of God, about God, that there is no God. Somehow they know that. They've visited every stone on every planet. Didn't find a God there. So, all major religions are not essentially the same. Then B, each religion sees part of the truth, but none sees the whole truth. Have you heard this? Well, they just, they know part of the truth. They just latched onto some truth, and now everybody's following that, but it's not the whole truth. Now, people arguing this often appeal to the story of the five blind men who encountered an elephant. After studying it, they came away with very different ideas. The one who handled the trunk claim that an elephant is much like a snake, the, the writhing trunk. The one who handled a leg claimed that the elephant was much like a tree. The one who handled the tail claimed that the elephant is much like a rope. And the one who handled the ear claimed that an elephant is much like a leaf. The one who handled the side came away saying the elephant is much like a wall. And there they are caught in the act. Let's just analyze this for a moment. The story makes sense only if you see the whole elephant. Do you know why this is a funny story? Because you and I know what an elephant looks like. That it has all those parts. That it's just part of the whole thing. We know an elephant is not like a leaf because we see the whole thing. But the skeptic here is then saying that he knows the whole thing. But he can't know that every religion sees only a part of the truth unless he sees all of the truth. He's got to see that whole elephant of the truth of religion 
or he wouldn't know that we're only seeing part of it. Yet that's the very thing he's arguing that cannot be done, that you can't know the whole truth. Yet to make this argument, he has to assume he does, recognizing that we're only seeing part of it. Then C, that says religious belief is too culturally and historically conditioned to be truth. Postmodernism, you may not understand that as a philosophy, but postmodernism view of truth says this. Look, all moral and spiritual claims are the product of our particular historical and cultural moment. It was devised because we live in this time and place. Therefore, no one should claim they know the truth since no one can judge whether one assertion about spiritual and moral reality is truer than another. Nobody knows. Nobody can tell. So don't claim the truth. Just claim maybe I have some truth. So it's like asking people, they say, from all over the world, what homeland is best? So their decision must be relative to their experience and not based on absolute fact. In other words, they're denying the absolute truth of any religion, only a relative, a restricted truth. But I want you to notice something. This claim that all religious thought is relative in itself. Yet it is a very absolute statement. It is making an absolute statement about all religions. But according to this doctrine, it is a religious belief that therefore must be relative and just based on where they live, what they think. It is a self-condemning truth or claim. They claim relativism for every form of thought except their own. We have the absolute truth. If cultural and historical conditioning make beliefs true only regionally and false absolutely, then this belief that they're holding to can only be regionally true and not absolutely true. We can go back. The argument was formulated, preached, and rejected back in 604 to 517 B.C., when Lao Tzu preached Taoism in China, he claimed all teaching is false. When people realized that if he was right, then his teaching must also be false. What you're teaching us must be false if all teaching is false. If you say all statements are false, it must mean that this statement is also false. These are nonsensical arguments, and you only, you can only agree with it if you have agreed into your ignorance of this concept. The fourth one is this. It is arrogant. You're just being arrogant to insist your religion is right and to try to convert others to it. How dare you intrude into their thinking, their religious, how arrogant you are to think that you're the only one who knows the truth. Well, first, this argument assumes that no religion is really right. This doesn't make sense. If there actually is one that's right, they ought to be trying to convert everybody else. So you have to assume that no religion is really right. If we take this argument out of the religious world, we can see its fallacy. For instance, is it really arrogant for me to demand to insist that 2 plus 2 in base 10 arithmetic equals 4? Well, you arrogant person, claiming that it can only be four? Can't I be respected if I feel it should be nine? I just feel that two plus two should be nine. It's, it's my feeling. See? Wouldn't it be more humble attitude if I claim it's only three? I'm not going to go all the way to four. <laughs> well, if that's where our mathematics is going... What's going to happen to our computers, our aircraft, our spacecraft, if everybody's allowed to decide results of math mathematics by feeling alone? 
there are some things that are actually true and some things that are actually false. There are some things that you can believe to be true, but in acting on them, you can kill yourself by taking the wrong medicine. Here's the thing that they're not understanding. Christianity is different from all other religions because it did not evolve from men's thoughts, but God revealed it to men. Now listen to a passage, verses 9 and 10, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10, and I'm going to try to explain to you that this first verse that you have often heard is talking about heaven to come is not talking about heaven to come at all. Okay, In the context, which I give you here, it's talking about the word of God. But it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. They stop there saying, heaven's going to be beyond our ability. Well, of course that's true. But that's not what he's talking about. Because he says, um, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. The Holy Spirit communicated God's word. It didn't come to us because I saw it, because ear heard it, because it entered into the heart of man. It came from God to man. Okay? What we hold in our hands in the Bible is what God said, not man's ideas. And second, the statement itself is a religious doctrine. Let's understand something here. It falls, therefore, under its own curse. It arrogantly seeks to convert us to its own version of truth. You have to believe this. You can't believe your thing. You have to believe mine. The skeptic's faith is that his own belief is superior to all others. These religions must now bow to his faith. Does this not sound as arrogant as he charged us? And the third is this. If no religion is true, then what does any of this matter? We are not accountable for our actions. So if there's no heaven and no hell, no, no effect for our good or deed, good deeds or bad deeds, then what does it matter? Why should the skeptic care if I believe wrongly? We die and turn to dust and that's it. So what? What happens in this life doesn't really matter, except to me at the time or you at the time. But in the long run, nothing. Why should he care if Muslims killed 2,819 in attacks on September 11th? 2001. What does it matter? And the third one sounds to be a compromise. Keep religion completely private. We don't care what you believe, just don't talk to me about it. This argument says, believe what you will, but keep it out of the public sphere. This is serious. <clears throat> In Philosophy and Public Affairs, Robert Audi wrote, the separation of church and state and the obligations of citizenship, this article, in this article he insisted we exclude comprehensive religious views from public discourse. Stop talking about it where I can hear you. On February 28, 2007, scientists and philosophers signed a declaration in defense of science and secularism. Secularism is a religious thinking. It calls on government not to permit legislation or executive action to be influenced by religious beliefs. Some say they're not opposed to religion, nor do they want to control religious belief. They just want to keep it in the private sphere. The secularist claims that his moral positions are universal and available to all, while religion's morality is sectarian and controversial. Now, the internal inconsistency is this, that any moral reasoning has a religious base. This is what they're missing. 
They're taking a religious stand saying we shouldn't take a religious stand. Let's consider the definition of religion. Let's look at what it can't mean. It cannot mean a form of belief in God because Buddhism does not believe in a God. And Buddhism is a religion. Now, religion cannot mean a form of belief in supernaturalism because Hinduism considers all to be a part of the material world. There is no supernatural. There is no spirit realm for Hinduism, and it's a religion. All right. So what does that leave us? We must define religion, and here I've given you some uh, room, I think, to say this. We must define religion as a set of beliefs that explain what life is all about. A set of beliefs that explains what life is all about, who humans are, and what is most important in human activity. When you're talking about these things, you are talking about religious beliefs. What, what leaf could you examine to tell you these things? What science, what chemical could you put into a test tube that would explain these things, you see? What rock could you analyze to come up with this? No, this, these are religious beliefs. So if your religion is evolution, because you can't prove origins, nobody was there, can't reproduce it. If your religion is evolution, there is no afterlife. The most important activity for the evolutionist then must be earthly happiness in whatever you decide to do. As long as I'm happy, maybe I'm a serial killer, but as long as I'm happy. And some call this a worldview or a narrative identity, but it is religious faith. So their secularism is a religious faith that rejects the supernatural. Just figure this. Anytime someone says you ought to do something or you ought not do something, that command is based on a religious value. You would say why? And they would tell you their religious belief. Now, the philosopher may call his commands pragmatism, but he bases them on his religious view of human happiness and fulfillment. Pragmatism is what works. Do, it, do what works. But that's all based on what they think works for human happiness and so on. Therefore, it is impossible to enter the public arena and leave your convictions of ultimate values behind. Your religious view may be there is no God. Your religious view may be there is a God. Your religious view may be that all of, all of materialism is a God. But it's going to be a religious view. You look around, all marriage laws in the U.S. are based on the biblical model of marriage, one man, one woman. Why not have multiple husbands, multiple wives? Should laws make divorce easy or make it difficult? The answer, you see, you base your decision on whether you think it is better for man to encourage long-term families or to promote personal happiness and freedom. Just change mates whenever you want. It depends on what you believe is your core belief. And that results in what you think. All right. Let us turn then, in the time we have left, to analyze the Christian faith. We've been looking at the way they're thinking. We saw that they're condemning themselves when they're trying just to condemn us. They don't know how to do that because they're taking a religious point of view. 
So analyzing the Christian faith. Number one, Christianity was not devised by man. We were talking about on, on Resurrection Sunday how that after the resurrection of Christ, there was this whole new set of religious views that had never been in the world before. This whole idea of personal resurrection. The Jews believed in a national resurrection. That, that vision of dry bones getting flesh and becoming alive. That was the nation of Israel. But they didn't expect personal resurrection. Now they're reteaching it. The Jews especially did not believe that any human should be worshipped as God. But here these people were worshipping Jesus Christ, who quite evidently was human on his days on earth. Christianity was not devised by man. Christianity was given by a compassionate God. And I say compassionate because this isn't God just trying to beat us over the head with stuff. This is him saying, if you only knew the truth, it would be much better for you. Number three, Christianity works to the benefit of all men. This is a better way of life, a better way of community. We were talking about that a bit in Sunday school. Then number four, Christianity is the most tolerant of religions, period. Hinduism, Islam routinely murder those who disagree with them. Christians want to interact. Christians want to become friends. Christians want to influence others to Christ. God's plan is not to murder the unbelievers, but to reach them, to win them, to convert them. Number five, Christianity is the most tolerant of those lost in sin. Our attitude toward the lost is the most tolerant view possible. Sinners became Christians by being forgiven, not by being superior. Christians aren't the, the cream that was skimmed off the top, despising all the ones that didn't make it. We were sinners being forgiven. Paul said, I was the greatest of sinners. God forgave me. He says he forgave me so that everybody would understand you could get saved. Christianity teaches them to forgive others as they were forgiven. That's the Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. I don't want to forgive them. They were mean to me and I don't want to forgive them. Even as God, for Christ's sake, for, hath forgiven you. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, he forgave me. I need to forgive others. They see sinners as prospective Christians who are unhappy in their sin and in its consequences. We accept, as Open Door Baptist Church, the term fundamental Baptist. Now, do not fall into this mislabeling of fundamentalism. Do not charge fundamentalists with violence. In fact, every version of religious thought has fundamental and unprovable aspects. These are the core belief of these religions. Every religious belief has fundamental beliefs. The adherent, the one who believes in these things, feels that these are superior beliefs to others. You believe you're, what you say is, is true and everybody else is false. Well, of course we believe what, what we say is true. We would be saying something else if we didn't think it was true. We're not just saying things because we have to say things. We're saying it because we believe it's true. This is why he holds to his belief. So the adherent, the adherent to various things who believes in the fundamental values of his religion, he believes that. Number six, Christianity is the path to a superior culture. I'm making this claim and I'm going to take our time here to, uh, to prove that. Got six minutes. The most open and tolerant religious atmosphere, religious, uh, tolerant religious atmosphere. This is a, a tolerant of other religions. 
was found in the Greco-Roman world at the time Christianity entered it from Palestine. And I think God had organized this so that Christianity wouldn't just be rejected because it was different. In fact, new, new religions were being welcomed. They were entertaining the magical religions of the East and so on. Such openness of the Greco-Roman world did not keep the culture from being brutal. Their religious religions allowed a great distance between the rich and the poor, and the rich despised the poor. Women were generally treated as little more than slaves, and the slaves were nothing but property. They would perform plays, and at one time the, the, the character is going to be killed with a sword. They would substitute a slave in there and actually stab him with the sword and kill him. The man's gasping out his last breath on stage. Christianity, with its intolerance of other views, no, that's not right. And its exclusive concept of salvation, you can't be saved by anything else. Salvation by Christ alone. It taught the value of human life. The value of human life. Because every person must live somewhere for eternity. When God gave you that first gift of life, when you were a cell fertilized in your mother's womb, he gave it to you forever. You will live somewhere forever. Everyone will. The only question is where? With God in heaven or away from God in the darkness and the despair and the death? Men and women, slaves and masters, they mingled together in the church as they prayed for one another. And this is why slavery was abolished, because they were just people. They expressed compassion because they had received compassion and salvation. During the terrible urban plagues of the first and second centuries, Christians cared for all the sick and dying in the city often at the cost of their own lives. Why? Because maybe they could win the dying to the Lord. But you could die. I will die. The question is, how will I die? We Christians believe strongly that our beliefs are right and others are wrong. So how can such an exclusivist thought lead to such sweet and open behavior? Well, here's the key. At the heart of Christianity is the perfect Jesus Christ who died for us. He gives us the greatest possible example and the greatest resource for sacrificial service, for generosity, and for peacemaking. Only those who had departed from biblical doctrines and biblical practice committed the injustices while claiming to be Christian. The religious wars of Protestants against Catholics on both sides were no longer Christian. Just groups of men, societies of men, clubs of men who were claiming one view over the other. They weren't Christian. You wouldn't kill somebody that you could win to the Lord. So, the first doubt is there can't be one true religion. All of their arguments depend on them believing their faith over us, over Christianity. And all their arguments then speak against their own belief. You and I need to let them know that what we believe in is true and it affects the very life that we live. Our Father, we thank you then for opening to us the reality of the thinking that skepticism is not some superior rational thinking, but just floating on clouds of ignorance, pretending that certain things are true, that they can laugh about them later. I ask, Father, that you might help us not to despise the skeptics, but 
to understand what we're saying here that we might ask them questions. Are you giving us a doctrine that tells us that doctrine is false? Are you telling us that your faith in your skepticism must be greater than my faith in God? I ask, Father, you might grant us then a heart of forgiveness, even as Christ forgave us. Help us to take his command to witness to him. We, we can't save people, but we can witness. We can tell them of Jesus. We can present the truth. And then thy word can have its own strength in their heart. Help us then, Father, not to be deceived by these false thinkings, by these skeptical ideas, not deceived, but rather informed. Help us to be counseled and wise in our latter end because we've listened to your word. With heads bowed, eyes closed, let me just ask you personally before the Lord, have you been affected by these skeptical concepts? Have you sometimes wondered about these things? You hear them so often preached on the TV and newspaper magazines that all of this Christian stuff is laughably old-fashioned. Are you affected by that? Is it something that you hesitate to speak of Christ because you don't want to be thought to be a hick dummy when you could have been asking questions that could lead to them doubting their faith and accepting Christ's. If that's your prayer, I wonder if you'd say, pray for me. I want to stand for Christ and stand for the truth. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up and say, pray for me. I need to be renewed in my understanding and speak the truth. Let me ask another question. That is, it may be that in your skepticism you have swallowed some of these false thinkings. You have assumed that all religion evolved. May I present to you Christianity that came to us not in little pieces to be evolved over the hundreds of years, but suddenly by Jesus Christ coming, living, dying, and rising from the dead. Let me ask you to turn from the faith in your skepticism to the faith in Christ. Father, we thank you for revealing to us the truth, giving us the opportunity to understand your truth. And then we ask, Father, that you might give us the presence of mind to reject the falsehood and accept the truth. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.